Good morning, Boys New Hope Church. I hope this message finds you all well. I hope you've all had a great day and a great week. Uh, today we're going to look at uh, chapter 48 in the book of Genesis. Last week in chapter 47, we saw Jacob come to Egypt. And we saw Jacob presented before Pharaoh as well. And Jacob was also concerned about his life. He's getting some longevity now. He's concerned about his final burial place. And so he commands his sons, uh, or commands basically Joseph to make sure that he is buried in Canaan at the cave of Machpelah with his ancestors as opposed to being buried in Egypt someplace. Uh, this week we're going to see a little more about um, Jacob's preparing for his passing as well as his blessing of Ephraim and Manasseh. So let's start off in chapter 48. Let's look at verses 1 through 7 to get us started. It says this, it says, Some time later Joseph was told, Your father is ill. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, along with him, when Jacob was told, Your son Joseph had come to see you, Israel rallied his strength and sat up in the bed. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan, and there he blessed me and said to me, I am going to make you fruitful and will increase your numbers. I will make you a community of peoples, and I will give you this land as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you. Now then, your two sons born to you in Egypt before I came to you here will be reckoned as mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine, just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. Any children born to you after them will be yours, and the territory they inherit will be reckoned under their names of their brothers. As I was returning from Padan to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan while we were still on the way, a little distance from Ephrath. So I buried her there beside the road, to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. So that's just a brief start there. And Jacob is now getting older, obviously. And so he sends for Joseph um, to come see him as he's sick. And so obviously Joseph is thinking, oh, my father's on his deathbed. He's at death's door. I should take my two sons with him to, to say goodbye and to um, receive any blessing that he might want to impart upon them. And Jacob then is recounting his journey um, from Luz down to Canaan, um, where God appeared to him, Luz, that is Bethel. God gave him the promise that he'll be a great nation. But then he also is recounting the time when Rachel passed away on that journey as well. And so it's been a couple generations, but that promise of God is still active and it still stands. And so Jacob, Israel, is reminding Joseph of that fact that, hey, even though it's been a little while, God's promise is still good. And so um, what's interesting about this conversation is that Jacob now elevates Manasseh and Ephraim um, to be equal with Joseph. Basically, he is now saying that Ephraim and Manasseh are my sons, and the inheritance beyond them will come from their inheritance they receive with me. So any children they have will be given inheritance out of what they receive from Joseph, not what they receive from Jacob, or from Jacob, not what they would have received from Joseph. And so now this uh, land of Israel that was divided into 12 is now going to be divided into 14. But he's basically saying these sons will be a direct inheritance of Israel. Um, and so they're going to be on the same level as their uncles. All because, again, we come back to that same story about uh, Jacob and Rachel. How Rachel was his favorite wife. She was the one that he loved, that he served for. Um, she was the one that really had his heart. And so because of that, because of his desire to honor Rachel and her legacy through Joseph, he's taking Joseph's sons, even though it's from an Egyptian lady, and elevating them to that same status. And so um, you just have to think that the impression this woman made on, the, on Jacob is significant. After all these years, he is still desiring to honor her memory through these actions. And so it's a pretty impressive just of the legacy that we can leave before us. But let's read a little bit more. Let's look at verses 8 to 14 next. It says, When Israel saw the sons of Joseph, he asked, Who are these? They are the sons God has given me here, Joseph said to his father. Israel said, Bring them to me, so that I may bless them. Now Israel's eyes were old and failing because of his old age, and he could hardly see. So Joseph brought his sons close to him, and his father kissed them and embraced them. Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again, and now God has allowed me to see your children too. So Joseph removed them from Israel's knees and bowed down with his face to the ground. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim on his right hand and Israel's left, and Manasseh and Israel's left hand and Manasseh toward Israel's right hand. 
This brought them in close, but Israel reached out his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head, though he was younger, and crossed his arms and put his left hand on Manasseh's head, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. Let's just pause there for a minute, moment. Here we have um, Jacob blessing the children of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. Um, the first he embraces them, saying, basically signifying that you are sons as my son Joseph is, so he's elevating them there. Um, and then Israel, Joseph is saying, okay, he's got his sons lined up. He's got Ephraim in front of Israel's right hand. He's got, I'm sorry, Ephraim in front of Israel's left hand. Manasseh in front of Israel's right hand, since Manasseh is the older. Right hand was the hand of blessing. So we get that all squared away so that my father doesn't have to see each one. He can do them both at the same time. But when Israel stretches out to bless these children, he crosses his arms. And so now all of a sudden his right hand, the hand of blessing, is now upon Ephraim, and his left hand, the second blessing, is upon Manasseh. And of course, that's reversed for how it should have been, where it should have been the firstborn son getting the highest honor. And so the question becomes, why did uh, Israel, why did Jacob do this to Joseph's sons? You know, it could be a number of reasons. Perhaps he's remembering the deceit he did to his own father, um, Isaac, when he stole Esau's blessing. You remember that story? Uh, or maybe he's demonstrating to all of us that our own way of thinking, that what we think should be first in this world is really out of line with what God's plan is. And so by elevating the younger son over the older son, he's reminding us that God uses anyone in this world, those that we least expect, to be a blessing to others. And so it's a good reminder for us to be humble before the Lord and accept those blessings he gives us, regardless if we think it's not in line with um, our cultural norms. And so it's just an interesting reminder, and we'll talk about that more here in a second, about this blessing between these two. But let's finish out this chapter, verses 15 to 22, and actually look at the blessing that Israel gives them. Then he blessed Joseph and said, May God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, and the God who has been my shepherd in all my life to this day, the angel has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. May they be called by my name, and the names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly upon the earth. Verse 17 says, When Joseph saw his father placing his right hand on Ephraim's hand, he was displeased. So he took hold of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Joseph said to him, No, my father, this is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He too will become a people, and he too will become great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he, for his descendants will become a group of nations. He has blessed them that day and said, In your name will Israel pronounce this blessing. May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. So put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, I am about to die, but God will be with you and take you back to the land of your fathers. And to you, as one who is over your brothers, I give you the ridge of the land I took from the Amorites with my sword and my bow. So we'll stop there for a minute. We're going to stop there at the end of the chapter here. So I have to consider the heart of the blessing that Jacob is giving these boys. He's giving them a blessing so they can increase and become a great nation, just as he was promised. He says Ephraim and Asa both will become great nations, but Ephraim will be bigger than that one. But what I find interesting in that blessing is that he doesn't specifically mention uh, blessing in the land of Canaan. They'll become a great part of God's people, but it doesn't say that they'll also have those inheritance in Canaan. And so Jacob is reminded Joseph of the promise God gave their family, and these two boys are included as those sons. And so as I said earlier, they'd have to receive their inheritance from Joseph, but now Israel says, no, no, their inheritance will be uh, on par with their uncles, basically, with everybody else. Instead of 12 inheritances now, 14 inheritances, which means everyone shrank just a fraction of a bit. And so we don't know how that went over with Joseph's brothers, um, but I can't imagine it was a comfort to their cousins. You know, think about that as all of a sudden, if Reuben's sons say, what about me? What about my sons? They don't have that same blessing that Israel is showing Ephraim and Manasseh. And further, this blessing being given, Joseph's a little put out uh, that his father's arms are crossed, right? He's a little upset that um, Jacob is putting his right hand on Ephraim's head, left hand on Manasseh's head. But Jacob did that intentionally. And so he's saying that Ephraim would become greater than his older brother, a thing we've seen a few times now in Genesis come up again. Uh, but also, again, as I said a minute ago, it reminds us of God's hierarchy is vastly different from our own. Jacob is a little put out by this 
crossing of things, saying, no, no, the older boy should become greatest, as was typically the custom. He would have received twice the blessing of the youngest. As the firstborn of the oldest child, they usually got twice the inheritance of the others. But Jacob is reminding us and setting up a different blessing. He's saying, now may God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh, basically two outsiders that were grafted in to Israel to increase in number. And so that's a, a perpetual blessing that uh, Jacob is setting up for the people of Israel. So in other words, um, age or social status or cultural norms or anything else that we might think is the appropriate hierarchy in this world can't stop what God wants to do for his people. Just because we say it should be someone doesn't mean God says it's going to be our way. And so it's really a reminder that God's system, God's value in this world, his way of valuing people is greatly different from our own and who we think wouldn't be a blessing to us or shouldn't have that position of authority or blessing often will because God has said, you know, he's really just there to shake up this, um, the norms of this world. And so then finally, as we finish out this chapter, we see Joseph again charged with um, seeing that his father is buried at the cave of Machpelah. It's a duty that tipped would have fallen to the oldest son, but here it's given to Joseph as the one who's basically saved his family. He's kind of become that firstborn child and has that responsibility. But we also see him given an extra portion of land that would have been his, that is his on top of the other inheritance he's to receive. And so again, it's one of those perks of being the favorite child, but also the perk of being the one who saved his family. The one who said, well, you meant for evil, God meant for good and sent me before you to preserve your life. And so Israel is really trying to bless Joseph and bless his sons and make sure they are fully grafted in to the family of God, not because they were um, born of his children, but because they've been a part of Joseph's family and basically a part of Rachel's lineage as well. And so I think the most important takeaway for me in these 22 verses is just the reminder that God's blessings don't fall along the lines I think they should. Um, they often don't look how I think they should look. They often don't feel how I think they should feel they often are not what I think they should be. But God is faithful to his people. He desires to bless us. We just have to be accept, open to accepting God's blessings in ways that are different from what we expect or want. Um, so even though we might think a blessing should be one way, just as Joseph did with Ephraim and Manasseh, um, Jacob said, no, no, it's going to be different because God has ordained the younger to be greater than the older. And so it's just a reminder that we need to not be quite so prideful in this world, not be quite so... Uh, set in our ways or stuck in what we think is going to happen, but allow God to work where he's working, when he's working, and how he's going to work, whether we like it or not, because he will work as God wants to work. So Jesus, thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for this time together and the reminder that your blessings are um, vastly different from what we think they should be, but Lord, they're so much better than what we think they should be. So God, thank you for that promise to us, and God, may we rest in those blessings, Lord. God, thank you for the work you do in us. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as always, thanks for joining me. I'm glad you did. Next week, we'll look at chapter 49 and um, read about Jacob's blessing of the rest of the sons of Israel. So until that time, remember that God loves you and we're a blessed people.